<clears throat> thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to, to reconnect with, with your university, which as we've said, I've enjoyed visiting uh, many times and um, it's very nice to have this connection with you uh, again. I, I, I thought that uh, I might start by saying something about my own background and how I managed to change from being a young mathematician to eventually getting involved in cancer research. And this is because when I was in high school, or it's equivalent in the UK, I enjoyed doing mathematics and I was reasonably good at it. So someone said, why don't you go and study maths in Cambridge University, which was always a major center for mathematical studies. Um, and I started there, in fact, in 1953, just months after Watson and Crick produced their famous paper on the structure of DNA, but I knew nothing about uh, genetics or biology. I'd had practically no teaching in biology when I was at school. But during my uh, lecture course in mathematics, I had a very stimulating uh, lectures from uh, David Cox. David Cox sadly recently died one of the greatest uh, recently living statisticians, a, a, a remarkable individual. And he mentioned to me that if I was going on to further courses connected with statistics, that there was someone called R.A. Fisher, Sir Ronald Fisher, who would be giving talks on uh, aspects of mathematical genetics and statistics in genetics and that I might be interested in going to his lectures. So I thought that was a good idea. And so the summer before I went to those courses, I started reading textbooks in genetics and some of Fisher's own difficult books to read. And I just became fascinated. And without having previously had any idea of what I wanted to do, I realized that that would be a subject I'd really like to do. So uh, soon at the, uh, after the beginning of my third year, when I was starting to take these lectures, I went to Sir Ronald Fisher, to R.A. Fisher, and I said, could I be a student, uh, PhD student with you? And so he took me on. So I became one of Fisher's uh, last students. Now, now this is uh, Fisher sitting, as I saw him when I was there, at his calculator doing calculations. And in case you're not familiar with, with Fisher, Fisher was really one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. He was the originator of much of what we now do in, in modern statistical analysis. And he was also a major figure in the development of what's called population genetics, how genetic variation can be studied in populations. Uh, and uh, through this, he was one of the uh, people who really established a relationship between the ideas of Mendelian genetics and how genetics works uh, and the ideas of evolution. He was, he was quite a remarkable figure. And then after I'd finished my PhD in genetics in Cambridge, it, it was a time when molecular biology, molecular genetics, a phrase actually coined by Sidney Brenner and, and Francis Crick working together in Cambridge, um, that it seemed appropriate that I should um, go perhaps to the United States and learn something about molecular biology. So I did that and I, I uh, made contact with another outstanding scientist of the 20th century, Joshua Lederberg. This is Lederberg as I knew him when I first went there and, and that was in 1961. Uh, Lederberg got the Nobel Prize for discovering how you could do genetics with bacteria, with E. coli, which of course underlies all that we can now do in, in many ways in molecular genetics and manipulating genes. And uh, so I've been very fortunate in my career in being mentored by two of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. And I think the one message I give to you from this is, while you can't choose who your parents will be, you can choose your mentors. And it's very important to choose mentors that you like to work with and, and who can give you stimulation, uh, as I was able to get from Fisher and, and Lederberg. Well, while I was at, um, at Stanford, in addition to learning about how to do molecular genetics with bacteria and work with DNA, I also came in contact uh, with the, someone called Rose Payne, 
who was working on, on looking for the differences between people that lead to uh, rejection of transplants. And, this, and so I became involved in some of the early discoveries of what's now called the HLA system, the Human Major Histocompatibility System. And that got me into human genetics. And I also started an interest in how you could do genetics with cells in culture. Uh, and then some years later, after I'd been in Oxford as a geneticist, I was asked if I wanted to be head uh, of a cancer research organization, as you've heard, the Imperial Cancer Research Fund. And so I was thrust into uh, the cancer field, having really known not very much about cancer, but I had to learn quickly. And it's since that, that time now, since uh, 1979, that uh, a combination of genetics and cancer has been my major interest. So with that, with that background, I thought I might give you just a little further background about um, cancer and, and colorectal cancer. Uh, and let me start uh, with um, uh, just reminding you about different sorts of cancers. Carcinomas are the cancers of the epithelial cells that line uh, many of the body's tissues, the lung, the stomach, and as you see, uh, the colon and the rectum. Uh, and it's the carcinomas that are the major 90% of cancers worldwide. Uh, and they're still major causes of death, increasingly so in countries that uh, previously didn't have such high incidence. Blood cancers, the leukemias and lymphomas are, are, are less frequent. And my interest has been in the solid cancers, as they're called, and in particular in colorectal cancer, which is, is still uh, amongst the third highest source of, uh, of, of deaths from cancer. So uh, with that, uh, what, what is the colon and why be interested? Well, I thought I'd give you a little, this is a little background. The, the colon is made up uh, of these crypts. Uh, and these are epithelial cells that line the crypts that are sort of uh, invaginations into the surface of the bowel. Um, and each crypt is indicated by the color diagram here. Um, e each crypt is made up of about 2,000 cells. And near the bottom of the crypt, the red things are where the stem cells are. The stem cells produce the differentiated cells. There are three types, columnar cells, goblet cells, and enteroendocrine cells. And, and that crypt is clonal because it's derived ultimately from just one stem cell. And it turns over every three, four, five days at a, at a huge rate. Um, it's surrounded by an extracellular matrix on which the epithelial cells sit and by cells called myofibroblasts. So that, that's a whole structure. So the, 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 that's, that's just one component of the whole of the colon and the rectum that looks like that. And cancers, of course, they, they, they start um, from the stem cells uh, acquiring genetic changes that, that gradually lead to the development of the cancer and the outgrowth of cells that escape from the controls of differentiation. Uh, and just to um, in, indicate, here, here's the example of what, of what a, a, a tissue would like. So this is a standard H and E stained tissue. And on the, on the left at the top here, you can see those are the um, regular, those are the regular crypts as I've shown you. Uh, one opening up into the, this would be the inside, the lumen of the bowel. And this is the un underlying tissue. And when you get a cancer, you can see here, there's still normal cells next to it. And here are the cancer. And the cancer is a completely disorganized version of that, of that tissue because the cells are growing ultimately um, with, without limit. Now, I want to emphasize that there are two aspects of cancer genetics. The first is the sort of classical, what you might consider the genetics, what happens with inheritance in families, and namely how the genetic makeup, how the genes and variants that you carry can influence the chance of getting a cancer. But the second uh, and very important aspect is of course, the genetics of the cancer cells themselves, how they change in a way that gives them an advantage to becoming a cancer.
So I want to start by telling you something about what we know and how I got involved in it too, uh, of the familial aspects of cancer, the inheritance in families of cancer, which actually have played an important role in the understanding of the basic mechanisms of how cancer develops. Uh, and one of the very first inherited cancers was called familial, poly familial polyposis coli. And what you see here on the surface are these growths. They're little cancer, precancerous growths, adenomas, they're benign. Most of them would just stay there as polyps. That's why it's called polyposis. And sometimes they grow almost like a, a, an atom bomb exploding in, into something that would develop into a, into a cancer. So wh what is that? It was shown, that was the first example shown by a, a group in, in 1925 in, in London that was actually simply inherited in families. And here you can see the black symbols are people who carry this polyposis uh, and the white are not. And you can see the difference between the males and the females. And this is actually the, the, one of the first published cases of a family history of how a cancer develops in a family and it's dominant. So you can see it goes from a, a male that carries the cancer um, to offspring and then to another generation. Um, and so uh, it took a long time from that initial discovery to trying to find out, well, what is actually the gene? What are the changes that give rise to that? And so here is work that is early work that I was involved in right at the beginning when one could begin to do genetics at the DNA level. Uh, and you can see that this gel, it's an old fashioned way now of doing it where these markers were a way of finding differences in the genetic component of a particular in the genetic variation in a particular gene. And you can see that these variations go together with the inheritance of the cancer in these families. You can see here, here, you can see that, and in this family like that. And in this way, we were able to find a gene whose variants in a family associated uh, with the disease, with, with polyposis. And it's through being able to do that that nowadays you could do what's positional cloning. Now everybody just sequences everything. It's become much easier. But in those days, it was quite a challenge having found where a gene was, but then to say, well, actually, what's it doing? So that's what's on this slide. So by finding the gene and sequencing it, you found out what it was. And it's a gene called APC. And it turned out to be very important in a pathway that's now called the WINT pathway that, that plays a role in, in, in normal differentiation in many ways. And uh, it's associated with a molecule beta catenin, which attaches to another protein that's very important in cell-cell connections. So actually having found from going from the inherited cancer to finding the gene and its function, you begin to get important information on functions that as it turns out, were very relevant, uh, particularly to colorectal cancer and other cancers. Now I give you another example of inher inherited cancer uh, in families, uh, which has become very well known. It's called the Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. It gives rise to polyposis. And, and Henry Lynch uh, started working, extending a family that had already been described where cancer seemed to occur in the families. In this case, there were many different sorts of cancers. The, the, the red ones are, are, are colorectal cancer um, and, and the yellow ones are other tumors and then there's endometrial cancers. And you can see each of these generations. So that's the father and the mother and going there and then the next generation. In, in each generation, there are individuals that have one or other of those cancers. And that's, a, again, a dominantly inherited trait. Um, and the individuals will, with a high probability, get a cancer. You can see the figures at the bottom. The commonest cancers in these families are, are colorectal cancers. Again, you get endometrial cancers in nearly half. You get some stomach cancers, some other cancers. And it turned out that in this case, the gene, when it was discovered, uh, it was an interesting gene. It was a gene that in, was involved in aspects of repairing DNA when you get mistakes in the DNA sequence. And it was called, they're called mismatch repair because it involves a complex of proteins. You can see here, 
um, that recognize when there's a, a mismatch in the DNA sequence, maybe one nucleotide, maybe a pair of nucleotides, uh, and this complex recognizes that and repairs the DNA. And that mismatch repair is very important <clears throat> because it helps keeping the DNA normal and not accumulating too many mutations. So people who have that mismatch repair defect uh, in their cells <coughs> that uh, eventually become uh, cancer cells carry a very large number of, 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 of mutations. Um, so the, the, the genes that are involved are the ones that code for these different proteins, HMS2 and HMLH1, are the two main genes that are involved in the inherited form in families. And as I'll go on to talk about in a moment, um, it turns out that mutations in that gene, those genes, and also in the APC gene involved in polyposis are actually key steps uh, in the cancer process when it's not due to an inheritance of the family. So those are two examples of familial cancers and, and subsequently a number of other cancers. And I'm talking mainly about colorectal, not about breast. And many of you may be familiar with BRCA1 and 2, uh, which are genes that give rise to increased risk of breast cancer. But in addition to familial polyposis cancer and the Lynch syndrome, which I mentioned, there were other examples, often much, much less common, much less frequent, but where there was clear familial inheritance and you could begin to identify the genes that were involved. Here, for instance, cadherin, which is a gene that's related to the function of the Wnt pathway that um, where there's a, a mutation in the APC gene, that's a mutation in cadherin. You get other sorts of polyposis involved with, with different sorts of genes, and you get some rare families in which the mutations are in poly and pol D, their DNA um, replication um, enzymes. And then a, another very early family that we found uh, turned out to be a, a strange thing. It's very few families have been found, and it's it's a deletion uh, of an important gene. So you have these inherited uh, cancer syndromes, um, and so that's that's a, a background to the simple versions of what what uh, the genetics at the familial sense is. But if you look at the overall picture the proportion of cancers, and let's stick to colorectal cancers, that are due to these inherited diseases is relatively small overall. Of all cancers, colorectal cancers, no than more than five or 10%, it varies in different places, uh, will have one of those familial forms. The commonest is the heredity, the HMPCC, the Lynch syndrome, FAP, the next, and the rest are very rare. Um, but in addition, there's clear evidence that there may be some sort of inherited contribution to cancers that doesn't reflect itself in being very clearly familial, but where there's a tendency to, to, to for evidence that somehow things may go in families to some extent, but you can't identify the individual genes involved. That's a sort of multifactorial, the sort of genetic variation that can be associated with how tall you are, for example. And, and the rest of it is what we call sporadic, where there's no evidence of any familial contribution. Uh, and what the changes are are totally changes in the cancer cells themselves. So I just want to say a little bit about the multifactorial side, which has created a lot of interest and give you one example. So one of the ways you can look for this uh, and you don't have to worry too much about all the figures. You can take, this is a single DNA variant that you can detect, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And there are millions of them that you can look at that vary between people. And you can ask for any given one of those, does it care more often in people with the cancer as compared to controls? And here you can see that in the um, unaffected individuals, it has a frequency of about 42%, whereas in the, in the cases, it, it has a frequency of about 50%. Well, that's a, a, a significant increase, but it's not a big factor. And you can say, well, how much does that genetic difference contribute to the risk of getting a cancer? And it's not very large. It means the risk is maybe increased 
from 1 to 1.2, about 20% increase in the risk of getting a cancer. And there have been many such genes found, mostly with much less effect than that. And they can uh, contribute to the risk of getting a cancer, but it's very hard to study them individually in the way that we did it with the APC or the mismatch repair defects. So while these can give you a clue and there are ways now of combining data from these together, where you can say, well, if uh, people have a lot more of these genes uh, than, than others, then maybe they're at a greater risk of getting cancer, so-called polygenic risk scores. Maybe you should screen them more often or from an earlier age, and that would help finding the cancers and dealing with them. But they really don't lead to any more significant understanding of a cancer. So, so with that background of the genetics as it goes through families, I want to go into, well, what about the genetics of the cancer cells themselves? Uh, and I want to start by telling you that you will all know that cancer is essentially a disease of older age. Uh, the graph on the left shows the increase in colorectal cancer incidence uh, with age. And you can see it starts going up sort of around the uh, 35, 40, 45, towards the end of the reproductive period. And then it goes up very sharply. And cancer really hasn't been an important disease for human populations until maybe 50 or 100 years ago, because at that time, most people did die before they would have got a cancer through infectious diseases and through other problems. But it was interpreted by um, Armitage and Richard Dahl, who was very famous for one of the people who discovered the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Uh, they suggested that these curves like that mean that cancer is a multi-step process. It's not just one change. It's a series of changes that eventually lead to the cancer. And the way you can think about it is, is like this. that You start off with a normal cell, and then there's a mutation that gives that cell a bit of an advantage over the others. So it expands. And then within that expansion, you get another mutation. And so you get an accumulation of mutations until you eventually get to, to the cancer that, that, spreads, that, that spreads elsewhere. Uh, and of course, within any given cancer, there may be some diversions. You may get more than one evolutionary uh, sequence of that sort. So when you think of it in colorectal cancer, um, it, it looks a bit like this. You have the normal tissue to start with. And then you get the other, as I showed you, the polyposis. You get early growths, early adenomas, just small adenomas. And then they get larger. And then you get the first evidence of a real cancer where you start penetrating the tissues below the surface of the, of the bowel. And then you get a local spread. And that's called Duke's B. These are now called grades one to three. And eventually you get metastasis, which is the spread of the cancer into other tissues of the body. And that's when a cancer becomes most difficult to treat. In colorectal cancer, if you catch it early, that Duke's A, that first stage, and you cut it out, it's a complete cure. Uh, but if you wait later, or you don't catch it until later, that's when you really have the difficulties. And it turns out that the genes that are mutated or that have other ways of changing uh, to influence their expression uh, tend to occur, some of them occur earlier, some a bit later. Most of the genes we know that are really important occur in the earlier stages of this process. And that process can take up to 17 years from the first start. So it's a slow process. And you'll notice APC at the beginning we now know that the mutation in that APC gene, the one that in families gives rise to the dominantly inherited polyposis syndrome in the spora sporadic cancers, that tends to be most often the first cancer, that's the you know, first gene mutation that starts things off. So now with the whole development, of course, of DNA sequencing, we, we've begun to identify most of the genes that are commonly mutated and seem to be driving the cancers, as we call it. And here's a list of the major mutated genes that we know about. And the symbols in red, you can see APC up there. I'm sure you've all heard about P53, KRAS, maybe not so much about SMAD4. These are the ones that occur in, in a higher proportion of colorectal cancer. So more than 20% APC mutations will be found in anywhere between 50 and 80% of all colorectal cancers. 
p53 mutations are, are found in about half of all cancers of any type kras mutations are and the ones that are found most frequently uh, can be assumed to be the ones that are the strongest drivers they're the ones that give the outgrowing cells to develop a cancer the biggest selective advantage it's an evolutionary process within the body's cells and then you get other genes that are intermediate in level that are important like we talked about the mismatch repair genes mismatch repair deficiency in sporadic cancers occurs in i don't know about 15 percent or so of cancers it's important um, and then you get other changes that are less frequent but still are found in a few percent and then there's a long string that where you'll find an occasional mutation in an occasional cancer and it's not entirely clear how important that is but it's certainly not as important as these more frequent cancers and i want you to notice these changes these are changes in the hla system the system that uh, means that we can't transplant from one person to another without rejection because of genetic differences but also the system that is a key uh, part of the whole way that our immune system works and i'll come back to why that's important so we know quite a lot about the genes that are involved and of course they give us clues for early detection in various ways uh, and what might be possible treatments attacking the function of these genes but in addition to mutations i want to emphasize methylation now methylation it uh, is very important as you probably know uh, you get methylation of the c of the cysteine in in, in dna and uh, when it occurs in the promoter region the region of a gene that controls whether you make message uh, then it can be a, an important influence on whether that message is made or not and when you get a lot of mutation a lot of methylation in that region then that switches the gene off that's how you get differentiation that's how you get many different cell types in the body that all express different genes although they have the same gene content so that methylation changes can be stable enough to be like mutations and so when you look at genes whose expression can tell changes by methylation you find for example that's two for cadherin it's a small proportion and it's actually true in the mismatch repair defective sporadic sporadic cancers the cancers that have that mistake are <coughs> mainly actually due to methylation in just one of the various genes that's involved in the repair process and another one and i'm going to talk about that in a minute that's important is is cdx1 cdx1 is a transcription factor it's a it's one of a family of transcription factors which are key proteins that control processes of change in expression and, and differentiation so that's a background so i'd like to go from that into into saying something about how we in my laboratory have studied some of these processes at the cellular level and we do this by using cell lines that are derived from cancers um when it was first done it was not easy to grow cell lines out they tended to grow more often from the more aggressively growing cancers the ones that are more difficult to treat uh, and a lot of people say oh well that's not really studying a cancer but that's absolutely wrong and i just show this slide you don't need to read all of it to emphasize that cell lines are very good models in the laboratory where you can study them and study functions and um, they're not contaminated with normal tissue and you can really study the functions of a cancer by studying what happens in these cell lines on their own or if you couple them with other cancers and in many cases they they don't have new mutations they're stable um uh, duplicate cell lines having been kept related for a long period of time are still the same so now we we work in my laboratory with up to a hundred different cell lines from different colorectal cancers so they contain they reflect the pattern of genetic variation and methylation changes that you would see in any set of cancers so using those we can study some of the process at the cellular level that happen in a cancer and and one of the first and let, let me just go back then to remind you that here's a, a picture of a crypt uh, and you can see that you've got the stem cells at the bottom uh, and this just emphasizes the fact that you go from the stem cells through what are called progenitor cells they're still dividing 
because you've got to go from one cell to a few thousand cells and that happens within turnover of, of, of just a few days and and then you've got these three different lineages you, you've got the goblet cells which i'm going to talk about in a moment that make mucus you've got the anti-endocrine cells they're the main cells that absorb fluid and you've got the um no, the anti-endocrine, sorry, they're, they're the cells that control muscular functions in, 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 the, in the gut, and the enterocytes are the ones that move. So this is a process of differentiation, which we can actually study in front of our very eyes, so to speak, by studying the cell lines. And by asking now, which, which cell lines can differentiate and which don't? Because it's quite clear from cancers, while escaping from differentiation is a major process that enables the outgrowth of a cancer. Many cancers still have a residue of some differentiation and we can study that. And many years ago, a talented um, pathologist who was doing his PhD with me, he found that if, if you took, he was one of our cell lines and you grew that instead of growing it on a flat surface on plastic, you grew it in matrigel, which is a mixture of components of the extracellular matrix, including uh, laminin and, and, and other things, uh, and, uh, and, and also some collagen. And he saw, saw that this cell line, if you, if you grew it in, in matrigel, it formed these structures, these are lumens. So this is like the structure of, of a crypt, as if you cut across it. And these are the epithelial cells and they're the, the nuclei of the, the, but it was only some cell lines that produced those, not all. And that's a reflection of differentiation of enterocytes in, in our cell lines. And we could tell, and then this was taken up by another talented young surgeon who at that time who did his PhD with me. And he, he studied this further and, and you found that the, the um, the, the cells in the cell line that made these lumens, they produced larger colonies and you had small colonies which didn't divide. So these larger colonies must be produced by the stem cells that can still differentiate. And here's an example. So here's an example of just one colony from one cell and it's stained with a, a EPCAM, that's a, a molecule that's present on the surface of nearly all epithelial cells very widely used. It's stained with this uh, uh, transcription factor that I mentioned, CDX1. And you can see most of the cells express it, although they seem to be more expressed in the periphery of the colony than in the middle. You stain it with chromogranin, which is a stain that identifies the anti-endocrine cells, and a stain for mucin, which is the mucin, is the uh, mucin that's produced by the goblet cells. So from this one cell, growing in the culture, you have a colony that differentiates into the three cell types that you find in the colon. So you're provided here by looking uh, at these cancer cells and how they behave in tissue with a model of studying differentiation uh, in, in the laboratory under very controlled conditions. So uh, just to take this a little bit further, uh, this we found other ways of distinguishing these are rather nice pictures which is why i like to show them so that's an example of a lumen from this cell line this is from that other cell line i mentioned and the blue stains the nuclei the red stains something called f-actin which is often found in this case it's well known to occur in these structures in the normal colon that are called the brush borders, which 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 uh, stain red. So that's an easy way to identify lumen formation. And then there are other molecules, this one called resin, esrin. So when you superimpose them, you get this bright yellow stain. And here's an example of the other. And here's an example of a cell line that's very aggressive. It doesn't differentiate at all, but it may produce some of the molecules that the differentiated cells do. It makes esrin, but it's totally unstructured. The esrin is just expressed on the surface of the cells. Now, how can you study what the role is? Well, first of all, we can say, well, what's the difference between the cell lines that do and don't differentiate? And we found that a key difference was the expression level of this CDX1 protein, that when the expression was high, then they made lumens. When it was low, then they didn't. And we could take a cell line that doesn't make lumens, put in by genetic 
uh, you know, transduction, put in the CDX, and then it doesn't go as well, but it starts making lumens. And we can do that with that cell line HCT116 that's very aggressive and doesn't make lumens at all. When you put in that CDX1, uh, then it starts making lumens. So that tells us from that experiment in culture that one important aspect of the differentiation control for these anthracites, which are a major component of the, of the colon uh, and, and the small intestine, a major control is by this CDX1 protein. And it's interesting, CDX1 protein has a partner, CDX2, that's very, very similar. And sometimes if you knock out CDX2, it's a lethal because it's required for the very early stages of differentiation of the gut. And, um, but if you knock out CDX1, it's not lethal because in those early stages, CDX1 doesn't seem to matter so much. Um, and when you get to the later stages, CDX2 can provide some of the functions of CDX1. But CDX1, we believe, is the key control for the enterocyte differentiation. Now, I want to give you another example of what we can study. And these are the goblet cells. They're very important. They're funny cells. This is a, a scheme of a goblet cells. These are all the vesicles that make the most important mucin. There are many different types of mucins. They're large molecules that have a lot of sugars attached and, and they're sort of mucus. They, 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 they form a sort of slime on the surface of, of the bowel. That's very important, the protective surface. It stops, um, uh, it stops bacterial infections and so on. It's a very significant component to the well-being uh, of the intestine. And, and MUC2 is the major mucus that's made in both the, in, in the, the small and the large intestine. And then TFF3 is another molecule um, called Tefal factor C. There are a series of them uh, that seems to have different functions, but one of its functions is to hold together the mucin so they form this structure. So when you stain normal tissues down here for mucin, MUC2 with antibodies, and these are stained green here, and red for the for the TFF3. If you overlay them, you get yellow. And this is a normal crypt, and you can see that uh, all all the uh, goblet cells are stained equally uh, with MUC2 and, and, and TFF3. So we can study that process and ask, well, which of our cell lines make goblet cells? Um, and here's an example. This is one of the cell lines, LS180, that we work with a lot. And this is just an example. It makes goblet cells. This is a nice picture using confocal microscopes. These are two single goblet cells. There are their nuclei. There's where they make the mucus in these vesicles. It's all present there when, when we released from the cells. There's the TFF3 totally uh, overlaid there. And if you look at the EPCAM, which defines the, the uh, outlying membrane of the cells, you can see that the membrane surrounds a whole cell there's the nucleus, uh, and, and there's the mixture of TFF3 uh, and, um, and MUC2. So we went to our cell lines, and it turns out we can classify them into different categories. So we find some cell lines that make a lot of MUC2 and TFF3, some cell lines that make much less, but still a significant amount, some that make even less, some, much to our surprise, quite a significant number that make a lot of TFF3, but not MUC2. And then, of course, a lot of cell lines that make neither. And that's the strongest selection to escape making goblet cells at all. And, and you can see that um, that's reflected in these percentages. So these are a high percentage of both, medium, low percentage, somewhat different there. And none of them up to, and then the ones that are all not. And we've been able to see those same patterns uh, occurring when we take tissue directly from a tumor and look at it. Um, and we think that's actually giving us a novel classification of colorectal cell lines, of colorectal tumors, according to how much they differentiate towards goblet cells, all in a direction eventually of getting rid of anything to do with goblet cells, including in particular the mucin. So that's how we can study things in cell lines. And you end up with a sort of picture of how 
the normal differentiation takes place from a stem cell, progenitor cell, CDX1 controls the differentiation into the enterocytes. You get what's called the secretory linkage, uh, lineage, which includes the goblet cells they enter and can, uh, and they involve aspects of uh, what's a well-known pathway called the NOT pathway that controls it. And a major controller of whether you get goblet cells is this transcription factor, ATOH1, also others that are involved. And what happens then in the tumors? It's probably not mutations. It's changes in the methylation pattern of ATOH1 or HES1. If HES1 remains functional, then that blocks ATOH and that blocks the production uh, of goblet cells. And so we can pick out from our cell lines where these different types of changes are occurring and, and which of them is due to what steps uh, that, are, that are blocked on the way to making goblet cells. Now, I want to, uh, as the final part of my talk, say something about cancer treatment. Obviously, we need new treatments of cancer. The cancer cells are very similar to normal cells. So many of the attributes of cancer cells that we like to attack, you find also in normal cells, which means that classical chemotherapy drugs, which attack dividing cells, can give you serious side effects because there are dividing cells in the body that are not cancer cells. And many of the functions uh, that are important to do with, with um, stimulation of growth, for instance, by growth factors and some of the uh, so-called tyrosine kinase uh, antagonists, um, they can be quite effective, but still <coughs> leave much to be desired in terms of really getting good treatment. Of course, the main thing you want to do if you can is to stop it, cancer, don't smoke, don't eat too much. Um, if you catch it early, try and scan for early cancers because then they're more curable. But beyond that, if you can't do that, you've got to find some ways of treating them that are as specific as possible for the cancer itself. And one aspect of that is using the immune system. The immune system recognizes foreign, so that's why uh, you get the recognition of a virus when it infects a cell. It's, it's recognized by the T lymphocytes and, and kills cells that make them, or you make antibodies. That's what a vaccine does, so that it blocks uh, the interaction between a virus and its cell that it wants to invade. And the immune system, as I've mentioned, also is there to recognize foreigners when we put a transplant from one person into another. But it's also been thought for a long time that maybe our immune system, which has evolved to deal with infections and, and, and uh, whether it's virus or any other sort of infection, maybe it also recognizes differences between a cancer and a normal cell. Um, is, there, is there some sort of um, mechanism by which that, that happens, surveillance? And that's been very popular. The only thing one can say is the immune system didn't evolve to do that because most of the time uh, during our evolution, cancer wasn't an important problem. But nevertheless, are there ways in which you can make the immune system attack a cancer? And one that's proved strikingly positive in a subset of cancers is the recognition that there are certain cancers, notably cancers of the lung, where smoking causes a lot of mutations in the cancer. And most of the mutations are nothing to do with getting the cancer. They're just there because of the mutagenic effect of smoking. Melanomas because of ultraviolet light. But then also remember the mismatch repair cancers. The mismatch repair cancers produce lots of mutations. And it was shown very early on, and we worked on that, that in the mismatch repair cancers, you often get loss of expression of some of the key components of the HLA system, the beta-2 microglobulin, that seem to reflect the cancer trying to escape from immune attack. So that leads me into the first uh, way in which they were quite dramatically over the last several years called checkpoint blocking. So what happens when the immune system recognizes foreignness? There's a danger that it can overwork itself and you get autoimmune diseases, of which type 1 diabetes is a very good example. So there are mechanisms that stop a T cell from being too active uh, when it's in its business. 
And it was shown that these mechanisms involve the production of surface molecules on the T cells and surface molecules on the cells they might be attacking. And the one is called PD-1 and the other PDL one And it's the interaction between these two that blocks the function of the T cell from killing when it recognizes its target. So what was done, and it got a Nobel Prize for the two people that in, in initiated this idea, is if you make antibodies to either the PDL1 or the PD1, then they will block this interaction. So you stop the exhaustion, you stop the T cells from being stopped from doing their job, which is killing the cells they recognize. And that's proved to be enormously effective in a subset of cancers lung cancer and melanomas, but in particular in the context of the genetics in the treatment of mismatch repair defective tumors. So when you take mismatch repair defective tumors and treat them with this anti-PD-1, you get a very increased survival. So this is progression-free survival, the deficient tumors and the non-deficient, and the deficient ones survive much better uh, and here's the actual survival overall. And it's a quite a striking effect. Um, so it, it has, there's no doubt that that's a, that's a very significant advance, but it only works in a relatively small subset of cancers. And as I've already mentioned, you can easily escape from that. Now, anything that attacks a cancer is at the risk of the cancer escaping by selecting for resistance, just like antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And really you'll never overcome that unless you attack two components of a cancer at the same time, when the probability of resistance to both happening at the same time is much smaller. Now I want to finish with a, a different approach to treatment, which says we don't let the immune system just do what it can to recognize cancers, but we actually construct either antibodies or T cells in a way that they will use the immune system to attack. And that's something I've been involved in with colleagues uh, in, in uh, a, a biotech company and also Roche. So the idea in principle is simple. You can engineer antibodies, right? Here's an antibody, right? And you engineer it so that it recognizes something on the cancer cell, but it also recognizes a component of the T cells, those cells which, if they're suitably activated, would kill the cell that it's recognizing, just as they kill the virus-infected cell. But by doing this, you divert the immune system to, instead of killing virus-infected cells, to kill those cancer cells that express the target you're working with. And, and the, the, the way it works is that cells get activated, they produce cytokines, the activation then uh, leads to the T cells killing, you get cell lysis and you get killing of the cancer cell that way. So I've been involved with colleagues, as I mentioned, in trying to make these uh, antibodies that function in that way, but in particular choosing appropriate targets, which is not simple. But we've been working on one target, which is an example of what can now be done. And this is a placental alkaline phosphatase. Now, as you would gather from its name, it's an enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, whose function isn't absolutely clear, even where it's expressed. Um, but that is found this version of the enzyme. There are three different versions of alkaline phosphatases, one in the gut, one in many tissues, but one only in the placenta, and a very similar one in the testis. So when you've got this, and it's what's called ectopic expression, for reasons that are not at all understood, and they don't seem to affect the function of the cancer cell, about 10, 15, 20% of many different solid cancers will express placental alkaline phosphatase. Now, when you use that as a target, it's essentially cancer-specific. Uh, you avoid treating uh, women with a placenta uh, when they're uh, pregnant. Um, if it uh, causes problems within the testis, that's not necessarily lethal, and it's hardly expressed on any other tissue. 
So that's an example of, a, of really a highly, and we, we worked on this many, many years ago and had the idea, maybe that would be a suitable target for developing an immune attack. But it's only more recently that the technologies for doing that have developed. So we've produced with colleagues, uh, with uh, a small company, Promab, that I work with very closely, and with Roche Pharmaceuticals, um, a, a version of the, this antibody to plant that is bispecific, and that if we combine the antibody with one of our cancer cell lines and with a source of killing cell lines, we just take peripheral blood uh, lymphocytes from them and mix the two together, then we can kill the cells. So here you see this is an assay that measures um, uh, keratin that's released when cells are killed by apoptosis. And you can see that um, you're killing the cells that have high levels uh, of, of PLAP very effectively. You get a lot of release of M30. But even with the lower levels, you get significant killing. And when it's negative, you get no killing. And in fact, even this killing, although the measure is low, we think most of the cells are actually killed. So this is a very promising approach, which we're trying to develop on a preclinical level. Now, I want to just finish by what I think is going to be the next generation of all this. Many of you may be familiar with the fact uh, that some of the best vaccines produced, uh, one by a company in America, one a company in, in Germany, are actually, instead of doing the antibody and making an antibody, you, you take, in the case of the vaccine, you take the sequence, the message for the protein that you want to make an antibody to, and you put that into a lipid nanoparticle. That's a, a mixture of lipids that people have found you, and you can do that. And instead of giving the antibody, the, the, the antigen, the thing that would stimulate antibody making, you give actually the message for it in the nanoparticle. And when you inject that, those are the vaccines I've had, I've had five of them so far, you get very good production uh, in the case of the vaccine of antibodies to what you put in in the message. But if you actually put in the antibody that you want to treat a cancer with into those, then you'll produce that antibody and that will kill a cancer. And there's now evidence that that may be the best way to deliver antibodies. Take the message for the antibody that makes the, the bispecific antibody, put it into a lipid capsule like that, and then give that. And I think that's the way of the future, making these highly specific um, targeted antibodies and delivering them in an effective way. You can do similar things with T cells and engineer T cells to T cancers. So far, that's only really worked. It's worked very well, but only worked well uh, with the uh, blood cancers, uh, the lymphomas and leukemias. So in my view, this is the way to go for the future. And it requires um, not only development of the uh, mechanisms for doing this and production, but a key thing is to uh, identify good targets. So that's the end of my story so far, trying to take you from the beginnings of thinking about genetics to where you might go in terms of treatment. Thank you.